told that to make this introduction properly, uh, that to make this introduction properly, I had to have this as a prop. <laughs> it sort of sets the stage. Uh, those of you who are itching for a cocktail are only going to have to wait a little bit longer. You don't want to do this at 9 in the morning, do you? It, it <laughs> could generate some problems. I'm going to leave it right there. Anyways, let me, let me tell you a bit about our speaker and the information that I have here. Uh, Don Lundgren is our speaker, and the history of cocktails in America and abroad is littered with ephemera. Littered, okay. Why does this narrow field generate so much printed material? I love these graphics, fabulous. From its roots in early America through today's craft cocktail resurgence, ephemera in many forms has and continues to play an important role. Don Lindgren, our speaker, is a lifelong antiquarian bookseller and the owner of Rabelais Fine Books on Food and Drink. Rare cocktail books and ephemera is a specialty of Rabelais, and he continues work on a descriptive bibliography of American cocktail books. Uh, I present to you Don Lundgren. Don? Thank you. Thank you very much. It's really uh, a pleasure to be here. Um, I would like to uh, talk today about cocktails and spirits. So we're going to go a little bit broader than just cocktails. And I, I hope that uh, with my presentation that I can give you a couple of things. One is a sense of how tied in cocktails are to uh, th graphically and otherwise to uh, their immediate and social, immediate social and cultural uh, moments. Another is to give you a general sense of some of the outside influences on the history of, of spirits and cocktails. And thirdly, to give you a sense of just how broad the field of ephemera is that relates to cocktails and what types of information one might be able to draw from the very many types of, inf uh, of, of, uh, of cocktail ephemera there are. We think of little cocktail books or we think of labels, but it's a much, much broader field than that. Um, and, and in order to really understand the field, we need to go and look at not only the, uh, the sort of fun stuff, but also some of the much, much uh, uh, deeper stuff. We look at business records uh, and business archives. So we're looking at economic history. We look at um, uh, legal documentation that's related to alcohol. And there's quite a bit of that, and it gets very interesting. And I think a lot of it's languishing, really, in some, uh, some collections because it's, you know, it's over there in the business collection. Um, so there are a lot of different types of things. So we're going to start first with this I idea of, uh, of, of the recipes for alcohol. And, and this isn't, isn't strictly recipe for alcohol. We're going to look first at some recipes for, for drinks. So this is a, an Elizabethan drinks recipe manuscript from 1599. It, these are not, by any stretch of the imagination, cocktails. Uh, but, they are, but they do talk about uh, the, the sort of restorative aspect of drink, um, both in a health sense and in a, just a sort of general pick-me-up feeling. And I think that that restorative aspect of drink is something we still talk about when we, drink, we talk about drinking. It's certainly something that alcohol companies use even in today's branding, uh, regardless of, of the health aspects of alcohol. So um, this is two recipes on a single uh, sheet, and the, the sheets had at some point been bound together, but uh, it was created uh, individually at, like this, and then um, uh, the back of it is actually inscribed to the recipient and, and dated as well. This is another recipe, and I, I included this one partially because I knew Lizzie was going to be speaking earlier and mentioning this sort of back and forth between the recipe and the receipt concept, and you'll see the little RX in the upper left-hand side, which stands for receipt, which is also, as we, we think of it as, as standing for prescription. Uh, and that's, that's as part of the origin of, of this word prescription and the use of Rx as, as it's associated with pharmacy. And it's kind of a nice example of how, uh, how, how recipes for something, uh, this is, and this is a, uh, um, a, a black cherry wine. So this is uh, not extreme, ex explicitly pharmaceutical, but certainly again, restorative. And I also want to call your attention here, without going into great detail, to just take a look at the format of what this is as a recipe. I mean, this is a narrative. It's a, it's a series of sentences. The ingredients are embedded within the narrative, and the instructions sort of unfold you know, one step after another. Um, if you were making any sort of recipe like this, uh, 
at home, you'd want to make sure you'd read it four times thoroughly to make sure you had all the ingredients and things we take for granted when we look at recipes right now. I threw one more in here because this is a marginal recipe from a, the, the, the margins of a 19th century book, but I really like this one because it includes the dragon's blood as, a, as, as one of the ingredients. <laughs> Again, it's in a narrative form. So we're going to think sort of about the idea of where, what the recipe is when we think about, about a drink as we go forward. But we have to think about all the other things that go into making that drink possible. And so we start with the process of distilling. And this is a, this is a patent. Um, this is from uh, Harris, Hall, Harrison Hall's The Distiller, published in 1818, uh, or one, a fairly early American distilling book. And this is just one particular element of distilling apparatus. But you can, you, can, you can spend an awful lot of time looking at nothing but the legal documentation for the equipment. And then there are other types of do documents for the equipment as well. And this includes trade catalogs. Um, I'm really fond of trade catalogs. I love, it's one of my favorite things to find that really apply to what I'm interested in. This is actually rather late. It's Paris, 1935. But it really feels still like we're, we're in the 19th century. And what I love about this is that it's portable. I love the idea of this sort of movable, <laughs> portable still. Um, and, and so you can, you can the, one of the great things about ca trade catalogs like this is that a lot of contemporary distillers, there's a huge craft distilling movement right now, and the craft distillers, you're going back and looking at this equipment to detect what they're missing from, from their process. And that's especially true when people are trying to make specialized alcohols like um, uh, a, an apple brandy, a Calvados, a high quality apple brandy in a Calvados style or, uh, or absinthe, which of course we're making again in America, which is all good news. So like, once, you, once you've, you've had your equipment and you actually go through the process of making alcohol, um, if it's commercial alcohol, they start talking about brand design. I'm, and I know I'm kind of jumping a bit here, but, um, but stay with me. Um, this is an original pen and ink on tracing paper. Uh, it was part of a little collection of these original pen and inks that came out. Uh, they, they, were, they were done in the, in the mid-1930s, um, or immediately after repeal. And uh, one of the interesting things about these is that they only have to do half of the graphic. So there's no reason for the person to do the graphic on the other half, although the lettering they have to do completely. And this also, if, if, you, if you think about what kind of, what this design starts to, look like, it, it, the closest thing you can come to is currency. And there's a reason for a lot of this, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to it in a second. Um, and, you know, bl uh, labels on alcohol can be extremely complicated printing, the same as, as you see with beautiful cigar labels and all sorts of other things. But one of the reasons that the, the printing is so complicated in some cases is because it's a way to differentiate the brand of an, of an unadulterated real alcohol from someone who's selling the fake stuff. That the, they couldn't control what someone might put in a bottle. You could buy bottles cheaply or make bottles. You could make the booze or some approximation of the booze. But what was really tough to make were complicated graphic labels. So it was used as a method of keeping uh, fraudulent alcohol from, uh, from circulating. Um, and I actually have a piece, and it's not in my, my in this demonstration, but I will have it in my booth, um, it, which is from uh, Fabrica Ancora, which was a Portuguese, still is, Portuguese spirits manufacturer. And the whole thing is a big accordion fold presentation of labels, and it specifically is there to show you that these are the proper labels. You want to look at these labels and recognize just how uh, carefully and beautifully printed they are, uh, how many different types of printing <coughs> techniques are involved, because then you'll be able to identify the cheap stuff when, it, when it, somebody tries to sell it to your bar or hotel. Um, there's legal protection of the brand. Um, this is a trademark filing for Rose's Medicinal Gin. Um, it's original pen and ink of the actual uh, label here. Of the, of the trademark itself, of the artwork. And this is the Roses people we know from uh, Roses Lime Juice. It's the same folks. Um, and this is, I, this is a, 
I love this thing, but it's complicated. Um, this is uh, legal documentation that was presented in a case in, in uh, a trademark litigation case in London in, in 1967. But what it is is a collection of, of, of sherry labels. And the purpose of the collection of sherry labels was to demonstrate that the words sherry wine or British sherry or dry sherry had been in use for centuries and that whoever it was that this, that this case was against could not just go out and say dry sherry, British sherry, old sherry is theirs. So they were protecting the general openness of the use of these, uh, of these phrases. And the labels that are in the book, um, each one's label is, there's text that goes along with each label and it says this label was in use as early as 1780 or this label was in use, you know, starting in 1943, or 1843. So they track the history of the labels in order to prove that this phrase, sherry wine, old sherry, sherry port, um, were, British sherry, were open uh, and could not be um, trademarked themselves. So once you've got a brand and you have your alcohol, you need distribution. Um, this is a little uh, pamphlet for Duvivier and Co., which was one of the largest importers and distributors of wine and spirits. In, in they were based in Bordeaux and New York City. New York City was really their their, their headquarters, um, and they started in in the late 1840s. Uh, started in Bordeaux, the the young members of the family moved to New York and started this importing business, um, and they started mostly with with local Bordeaux wine. But they ran it. They, it's a, it's this company lasted until prohibition, and that killed them. But between 1840s and prohibition, they, the archive itself demonstrates the tensions and pressures that were put on the alcohol system in America, uh, and the kind of adjustments which were made, and then the the actual impact it had on the marketplace. So these guys started importing wines. Uh, along come, I'm going to really shorten this, but along comes the Civil War, and the import uh, tariffs on, or import tariffs are raised on all sorts of products from overseas, including wines and spirits, uh, a great deal to raise money to fund the war. And so these guys have a system of importation, warehousing, and distribution in place, and they're like, we're not going to just shut down. So they start looking for other types of products. So they they start looking at uh, American products like Kentucky bourbon or New England rum, and all of a sudden that stuff gets added to their ledgers. They start looking at uh, British pickles, which of course still have import duties on, but not the same as the spirits and wines did. Um, and they start looking at more and more American and local products. This stuff is all uh, demonstrated through the, the, the ledger volumes of, of their archive. There are about 30 large ledgers like this in their archive. Each ledger is about this big. And the ledgers cover what materials they were importing and who they sold it to. It covers all of the labor aspects of their business. And then it covers the kinds of accounts that they had all over the US. And you think of a company in, based in New York in the 1850s, 60s, 70s, and you think, how far are they going? Where are they actually reaching into in the US? And this little group of note, this is about a third of the notebooks. These are little blue leather-bound notebooks, each one corresponding to a city or group of cities in the U.S. And these guys, in, by the 1870s, were selling wine and spirits into Cheyenne, Wyoming, and Fargo, North Dakota, and northern Texas. I mean, they were, they were way out there. Uh, and each one of these notebooks records uh, the types of uh, accounts that they had, so, or, or potential accounts. So they would go into Cheyenne, Wyoming, and they were observed for a few days, and they would ask themselves, is there anything here? Um, and they actually do say about Cheyenne, we don't know if this town is even going to be here in 10 years. They're not sure. Uh, but they, wanna, they go into the bars, hotels, and restaurants, and they talk with the people who are owning them, and they try to determine if they were trustworthy. And uh, one of the first signs of untrustworthiness is that they drink, which is interesting. <laughs> uh, another sign is that they smoke. Um, but what they're looking for is that they're married, that they're church going, that they own property. Uh, what are their customers like? Wh and then ultimately, what do they drink? And is this a proper account? So I just wanted to include, we're going to get to some real cocktail books, don't worry. But I wanted to include this because I just really wanted people to think about all the things go into getting that drink in into your hand. 
whether it's at home or in a bar. So now we move to the bar. And if you look at this photo closely, you'll tell me that it is a soda fountain and not a bar. But it's the only photo I had that was kind of like this nice looking. So, um, And soda fountains and bars are very, they're very, very intertwined. Every bar needs a license. Um, and so again, we're looking at legal documentation. Um, this is an American colonial tavern recognition. It's 1697. It's Bristol County, uh, which is probably New Bedford uh, area now. Um, so we're talking six years after uh, the uh, cessation of Plymouth Colony. I think it's six years following that. And this, not only is this, well, first of all, the, uh, the, that the legal uh, recognition is granted, of course, by the English king um, through, through an American surrogate. Uh, or through a, a local surrogate, and um, it, tell, it gives them the right to sell food and spirits, but it also tells them what they can't do, and, it, and there are two sections here that I think are particularly interesting. In the middle of it, it talks about how there's no gaming, there's no gambling, no skittles, no coits, no, there's a whole list of games, some of which are more or less recognizable to us. The other thing is who they're not allowed to serve. They're not allowed to serve servants, apprentices, or Negroes. And that's stated here. And I think it's interesting to see that. I mean, I'm, it's, I'm not saying it's unusual to see, but it's interesting to see that that's being stated so early. So um, bar licenses, you'll see. I mean, they're, they, I'm, I'm sure many people in this room have run across them with some regularity. Uh, but this one is very early, so it's, uh, I, I like this one a lot. Then you've got to start thinking about what you have in your bar, which includes barware. Um, this is a, uh, uh, actually, it's in the back of a trade catalog for the Liquid Carbonic Acid Manufacturing Company. And uh, what this, there are a couple things that make bars explode in America, really become popular. And the same thing's true for soda fountains. Uh, and, and one of them is a liquid carbonic acid, which is carbonation. So the process of carbonation adds a whole new set of ingredients that allow bars and soda fountains to get popular. The second thing that becomes, that makes the sort of explosion of bars in America, uh, or the popularity of bars in America explode is, is, is commercial ice, the availability of ice, which was a very, very large scale. Uh, well, in the, the original process, you know, you've got to cut it out of lakes and drag it to places and store it, and it's not the kind of thing you want to give up easily in a soda drink. But uh, once ice was commercially manufacturable, and that that process was made smaller and smaller, um, it entered right into bars. And you've got all the software to go with the bar hardware. And this includes things like the bar menus themselves, uh, matchbooks, uh, on all sorts of swag. This is, you know, this is much later stuff, but I thought I'd just show it as a group. Um, every one of these things is its own category, and I'm sure that there are plenty of people in the, the room who could speak to any of these categories in great detail. Um, there's a lot of other stuff you need for your bar, um, and this is a this is a, a Benton Myers and Company trade catalog. It comes out of Ohio in 1889. Uh, it's a soda water supply company, but they also sell bar supplies, and that includes things like bitters, uh, um, simple syrups, uh, flavored syrups, um, all, you know, lemon extracts, and things like that. And they also sell punch bowls and punch ladles and all that kind of stuff. Um, I love this catalog because of this beautiful color uh, cover lithograph cover. It's also got some really gorgeous um, sort of silver ink plates on the inside, but they're impossible to photograph because it's a tight little book. And this one's unrecorded. This is the only, the only one that I've been able to find. And of course you need the bartender. Um, the, the bartender, the, the gentleman in the middle is, is generally recognized to be Jerry Thomas. And this, uh, this uh, image appears in his book uh, which had a number of names, um, but the gentleman's companion is one one of the the names, and it's it's the first sort of completely recognized bar guide. Uh, it was published in New York in 1862 by Dick and Fitzgerald, who published it's a book, but they published many many sort of how-to guides um, and other sort of popular and helpful household things. And there's a there's an interesting debate about whether Jerry Thomas was supposed to be the original. Uh, author of that book, and whether Dick and Fitzgerald thought they could do it on their own originally, and then uh, eventually uh, said, ah, oh, we can't pull this off without someone who knows what they're doing, and they hired him. 
Um, and I'm going to show you something that's related to that question in just a second. But I, I want to point out that that image of Jerry Thomas in 1862, well, even though that's the first American cocktail book, and really the arguably the first cocktail book ever, this idea of, of the bartender and uh, doing something flashy and entertaining at the same time that he's giving you a drink, and it's just a place to go, not just to get drunk or something, but really to be entertained. And this kind of bar flair, which is still talked about, there are contests in Las Vegas for bar flair to this day, it shows up you know, throughout history. So we've got 1862, we've got 1890s on the right, that's a Philadelphia cocktail book. Um, and the mixologist was New Orleans, uh, Young and Wolf Company was actually the premier American absinthe maker. And they were really thrilled this year because this is when repeal occurred and they were once again able to make their absinthe. And a year later, the federal government said, eh, no, not absinthe. You can get all the other ones, but not absinthe. So they, they disappeared uh, fairly quickly. But anyway, this idea of the, the bartender as a entertainer as well as someone who makes you a drink, is a very old idea. There are, there are accounts in, of, of uh, uh, Frenchmen traveling in America in the 1840s and 50s, and I think late 30s, where they refer to bartenders. And they're like, this is amazing. Like, America, I'm not so sure. That's kind of a dirty place, and the people are a little rough. But they've got this thing called you know, bartenders. <laughs> and it's uniquely American. And it's, it's something that was, that's really specific to the American people and the American output. Um, and that goes well back before, before Jerry in the first book. Um, and it continued. When you talk about flash bartending, this movie, this is the, po the poster from Tom Cruise's cocktail, um, the movie poster. And that whole movie is really about flare, what's called flare bartending, which is what you saw in the very, very first cocktail book. These are, uh, this is a kind of, I, 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 I gather, unsung piece of ephemera. These are the advertisements that were printed separately and included into printed books. And these are two sets of the advertisement uh, inserted into Dick and Fitzgerald's uh, titles. And they were the publishers of the bartender guide, but these were in other books. And these advertisements actually run back uh, 10 years prior to the publication of the book. And they actually do include Jerry Thomas's name. I should be using this thing. But they do include Jerry Thomas's name here. And so that issue of whether Jerry Thomas was intended to be the author of that book is settled by closer examination of the advertisements that were published in other books. Um, and this is something that's kind of just come to light very recently. So if you're mixing drinks, this is where we get to the product books, um, you, or, you, or to, to cocktail guides or cocktail recipe collections. Um, a lot of them were produced by the uh, alcohol companies themselves. And the idea was to give either uh, bartenders or home bartenders ideas of what to do with the drink. You, you buy, you, it's one thing to get somebody to buy a bottle of something. It's another thing to get them to use it enough that they have to buy a second bottle. And I'm sure we all have something in our cocktail cabs or liquor cabinet at home that we've never used and probably will never use. I'm going to really t briefly touch on temperance and prohibition, and there's a reason why. Uh, because the, the temperance and prohibition movements really affected what happened to the cocktail world in a positive way, in addition to all of the negative ways we can think of shutting down an entire category of economic product might be. Um, this is a very uh, early uh, Parson Weems piece, The Drunkard's Looking Glass. It's the third edition, but it's the first illustrated edition, so it's the one I really like the most. And the illustrations inside are just terrible of, of what's happening to the people uh, as, as a result of, of alcohol. And on the right is a, uh, an interesting, this is actually, a scholarly study was done comparing st children and their, their performance in grade school when they drink or they don't drink. Um, this is from this is from the late 1920s, but so prohibition drives the cocktail world, drives drinking and, and alcohol underground. We know that we know that from all the movies. But 
the cocktail guide takes a kind of odd twist during Prohibition. And the first thing that happens is stuff really goes underground. This is a, this is a record of sports. It's published about 1917, and the way we're able to tell that is to look at the sports records in it. It actually runs, it's like baseballs, like, like you know, home run records and whatnot. It goes right up to 17. Prohibition starts in 1919, so it's, it's, it's probably published within the year or two following that. And it's 20 pages of sports records and then three pages of cocktail recipes and 20 pages of sports records and three pages of cocktail recipes <laughs> and so on. So you could have this around and, uh, and you, you know, could have it in the house and no one would know that you're using these cocktail recipe books. But what really happened during Prohibition is that the cocktail world went abroad. And so the great bar bartenders in hotels or, and, and, and other drinking establishments in America got on the boat and they went to Havana or they went to Spain or Latin America. Uh, and so there was this great exodus of talent uh, and that also brought the, co the concept of American cocktails to Europe uh, and, and, and other places. And it was, it was always recognized as a uniquely American thing. It wasn't just like, oh, yeah, drinking, now it's, there's something else available at the bar. They saw this as a specifically American import. And uh, here's some other ones. This is an Australian one with some race issues. <laughs> but the French really did not like this. The French did like cocktails, but the French wine uh, industry hated cocktails. And so a, 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 a campaign, a number of campaigns, including a really one that produced some of the most beautiful, I think, printed uh, ephemera, uh, was started by the Nicolas Company, which is still to this day uh, the sort of corner wine store. If you're in Paris, the Nicolas is one of the places you can run in and buy a, a bottle of wine. And they were a very, very large distributor and re remain so today. And they hired some of the great Art Deco illustrators um, to create uh, books that extolled the pleasures of French wine. But some of their publications, and this one is from one called uh, um, Noir et Mauve, I think. There's three volumes, and each one talks about the evils of cocktails in a different way. And this one, you can see that this is the Statue of Liberty uh, holding a cocktail shaker with the, the skeleton hand, and then the, the sort of you know, uh, a, a, dep a depraved bartender inside the cocktail shaker on the right. And if, if you go through this book and some of the other ones they do, uh, there's this another book in the series talks about how the evil, um, uh, the, the Russians are sen sending vodka and that's just, that's just their crazy communism invading us and the Germans are imperialistic and they're sending us their beer and the, the uh, uh, English are sending their, uh, their gin and, and all of the images are just gruesome and dark, and the, but very beautiful, rich prints. And then you get to the, the section with, it's called France, and it's a picture of people in a farmhouse and with, with ducks and flowers, and the <laughs> sky is blue, and they're drinking wine. So this was a specific propagandistic effort against the, the, uh, uh, the arrival of cocktails in France and, and the threat that it, that, uh, it, it uh, had against, uh, the threat that it posed to the French wine industry. So it's amazing how quickly people jumped on the bandwagon as soon as repeal occurred. And I mean, really, it, there were a bunch of people who jumped it entirely. And there were a lot of cocktail books and cocktail booklets that were published starting in 1928. And I'm still not exactly sure why 28 seemed to be the point at which they felt they could just, they could just openly publish cocktail-related material. Uh, but the Mr. Boston showed up uh, in we know it is the Red Book now. This is the first edition of it, which was much smaller, a little pamphlet. And the Mr. Boston showed up in 1931. So that's two years prior to repeal. And just to show how like ordinary it was for people to, re -embra to embrace alcohol after, after repeal is this pamphlet on the right, which was inserted into issues of the settlement co or uh, copies of the settlement cookbook, which we think of as a real home cookbook, but they made a special 16-page uh, supplement which was inserted into the book of repeal recipes, and those are all cocktail recipes. So, you know, it's hard to imagine them inserting something similar into, you know, the joy of cooking or, but it would, it would be exactly the same. 
the bartenders needed guides too, and these guides came in all sorts of forms, often uh, provided by a company that sold equipment. So the guys on the left actually uh, sell beer uh, dispensing equipment. They sell all the siphons and the, and the, the, the equipment to pump beer in, into taps. Uh, but they included cocktail recipes, because if it's 1934 and you're opening a bar, you, your bartender needs something to reach for. At home, people needed uh, bartender's guides as well. And so there were loads of these little booklets that were made. And most of them were handed out by local liquor stores. And they were sponsored by bigger alcohol companies. So most of the time, these guides, this household guide to wines and liquors, ev almost every time I see that, it's stamped with a different wine store's uh, label on the back. Uh, on the one on the right is, is blatantly a, a, a Seagram's advertisement. That's 1936. And some of them were promoted by the government. This is not my favorite example because it's not alcohol. Uh, but it is, it's interesting because this is the, the, the state of New Jersey's agriculture department is promoting snappy milk drinks for the good old summertime, taking the fountain into the home. There's your so soda fountain again. But the reason this is in interesting to me is that that illustration is a John Held Jr. illustration. And you remember you saw that illustration at the beginning of the of the, the presentation with the, the upheld glasses. John Held Jr. did loads of, of alcohol-related stuff, and his name is intimately tied to cocktails and alcohol. So for the state of New Jersey to use him, and he's winking, <laughs> makes me wonder. Um, it's hard to avoid the style aspect of cocktail books. Um, and I'm only going to show you a couple of them, but this, is, this one is particularly beautiful. This was illustrated by Russell Patterson. Um, it's 1935, so it's just two years post repeal, um, and uh, I think this one, this was a rare one. This was, this is, I think this was one of two copies known. Um, and then of course, that style thing had a kind of a other side to it, which was novelty. Um, I'm not always a big fan of the novelty books, but cocktails, they were, you know, there were dozens and dozens and dozens of these sort of gag books done, and um, there are four different astrological. Uh, cocktail books that I'm aware of, and that's a lot of astrological cookbooks. Um, and you remember at the beginning I talked about how recipes, uh, I, I asked you to look at those recipes that were in narrative form and, and see how it's sort of a big paragraph of sentences with ingredients stuck in the middle. One of the, one of the reasons I wanted you to just notice that is that the reality is that the idea of recipes has, has morphed a lot in, in, over the centuries, and we've we've really come to think of them more as formulas. And when it comes to cocktails, the formulas are very specific and can be really particleized. They can be taken down to these little tiny bits of information, which allows people to do all of these really oddball, interesting physical forms. So this thing on the left is a slide rule drink mixer. And you have these lists of ingredients here. And then. Uh, over here, you have um, acti you know, the things you have to do with the ingredients. And up here, you have the names of all the cocktails. So you can move, and you put it, you line them up between the black lines, and then you get your information here. And then you look at the things you're supposed to be doing here, and you've got your cocktail. So it's, it's this like really tiny particleized bits of information that, that allow them to do these odd things. There are also loads of these Volvel uh, cocktail recipe things. And I like this one because it's actually really tiny. It's only about this big. And it's metal, and I, I kind of like that one. But my favorite of all of the novelty uh, sort of ways of, of organizing the information is this one. And this is, uh, this is uh, after John Held Jr. Um, see, it says down here, with apologies to that master engraver, John Held Jr. And it's called, called 40 Famous Cocktails. Um, and it's both sides of it are great, or, but I'm, I'm only showing you one. And it, if you look at this, is the card that goes inside that you can see here. It says pull here, hold the bottom. You hold it down here and pull up here. And this is all of the data that's included on the card. And as you pull the card up, the data here shows up here and here in this whiskey bottle and over here and over here. And this guy's eyes move. You can see all the eyes here. <laughs> So, so again, what you're, you know, if you, 
on the one hand, it's a great, it's a beautiful piece of, of cocktail ephemera, but it's also a really interesting system for organizing data. Uh, this is, uh, off the t uh, I, I think this is 34, but I have it, I have it in my booth, but I don't, off the top of my head, I'm not sure. And I have one of these, too, in the booth. So I, I take a real brief thing to cap this off. The great thing, for, for, as, as somebody who enjoys cocktails, I love the fact that the cocktail world is very active today, and it's improving. It's like there are people like looking for classic ingredients in the same way that people are looking for heritage seeds. People are looking for those historical ingredients that used to be used in cocktails. They're spending a lot more care making them. And as an ancillary to all of that, cocktail ephemera is actually making something of a comeback. This is a, a piece that, um, uh, it's, a, it's a sample slide that was given to me by, by uh, some guys I know who have a company called Might and Main, and they do restaurant and bar uh, design work. And all of this material, all of which is, uh, uh, not all, it's not all letterpress, but some of it is letterpress, which is very nice. And it includes a lot of different categories. You've got your coasters, you've got your bar menu here. This is an oyster bar, so they've got their oyster menu here that you can't see, um, and other stuff over here. Um, so that there's a lot of contemporary uh, cocktail ephemera, which has the same sort of exciting graphics. It's tied to this, mo this particular moment in the sort of cocktail culture. Um, and it's all coming back in, in a really exciting way. There's one last thing, I'm, and you're not going to be able to see this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, there's a type of ephemera that I, I don't, I'm not the person to try to really address this, but I hope somebody is. And that's right here. Um, what I have this on, on my screen right now that none of you can see is something else that these same guys do. And, and one of them is basically little graphical, uh, they're, they're GIFs that have imagery and text that appears in Facebook advertisements. Now that's only one, ty one type of online advertisement. But this is all, all of these examples they have on this, on this thing I'm looking at right here are for one alcohol company. So it's, they're, they're still trying to, you know, they're trying to get exciting style and interesting text and get out there to the public to do the same things that the people advertising 30 years ago and 100 years ago were doing. But now it's happening like this. And I do hope that somebody, institutional or otherwise, is thinking about how to collect this kind of stuff. Thank you. Oh, questions, right, questions. Anybody? Yes? Uh, what do you want to find commercially available? Where do you do that? Ooh. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm going to skip on the how they did that part completely. Um, I'm sure that, uh, would you care to speak about com how commercial ice at all? I think you'd, you'd. Well, I know in Philadelphia, commercial ice was available all year round. The downside to that was it was being sold by the university. Uh, no, by the Pennsylvania Tax Service. So when they were done with cadavers, they sold the ice to the hotel. <laughs> oh, yeah. Ooh. It came out of the Schuylkill River. And it, it just yeah. Yeah, com commercial ice has been available for centuries. That it would, uh, they used to pull ice out of the lakes in Maine and drag it all the way into Boston. Cuba. Yeah. Boston. Yeah. And, and, uh, but the idea that ice could be made locally and, and, and inexpensively enough. The same with carbonation. You know, carbonation was possible as a chemical process, but to have it I happening, happening right in your bar, that's when it, when it sort of, when it really took off. Owen's Hotel in Philadelphia, which burned in 1792 or something, was very famous for its ice room. It had, it had a 20 by 20 block of ice down in straw, and I'm sure there were other mm. hotels like that. They took the punch bowl on the, this, this big block of ice and put these holes in it. Hmm. It's it's 18th century at least. Yeah. So. Yes. Was the third step to try to bring some versatility to it that you might be looking at adding as a new flavor? Well, um, I know a little bit more about it than than that, but I also want to. I, I was t talking before this um, with William about this and. Uh, I think it's I think it's sometimes a mistake to try to chase the the definitive uh, occurrence of 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 drinks in particular, and that's because as um, 
uh, as Mr. Voigt said at the end of his presentation, uh, or, or towards the end of his presentation, that there's a lot of hype involved. And the, the kind of hype, you know, the, the, the histories tend to be written by people close to the restaurant or people who are probably drinking free at the restaurant or they're, you know, it's, or, or they're, just, they're just in love with the lifestyle they're living. And so the histories are about the great stories and not about the histories. Um, the, the Bloody Mary story is that uh, the origin of the Bloody Mary, there are three competing stories. Um, one is that it's the, the George uh, Jessel at the St. Regis. That's one. The second one is uh, um, the, it was Harry's Bar. It's not Harry's Bar. It's called the, the, America, uh, the New York Bar in Paris is another one, and then uh, 21 claims it as well. And these, there's all printed the documentation for each one of those. The same thing is exactly true with the origin of the cock, of the word cocktail. And, uh, you know, you have the first book is 1862. The first contextual appearance of the word is the beginning of the night, is like the first decade of the 19th century, and there are a couple competing cases there. But in almost every one of these cases, the, the, thing, is, the thing exists you know, decades, years if not decades prior to its printed appearance. So, you know, it's good to chase the, the origin stories as far as you can, but you should always remember that there's probably 10 years of something before that. You know, the first mojito, mojito was at least, it was in the first printed mojito recipe, which was the Cuban mojo, which was printed in 1930, is, is probably at least 15 years later than the original, the origin of the mojito. Anybody else? Yes? You know, I've written a lot of columns on the Cuban mm. and the, the discovery of that the fact. Yes. And I don't know of any more detail about the origin of the word cock. I don't know that. Um, I know that that's their logo, and I've seen it for, for ages, um, but I don't, I, I don't know. And I'm surprised that that's not included in that book. It's a good book. Yeah. Yeah. One, one thing, a point I failed to make, and I'll, uh, when I was talking about the bartenders all leaving, is that after repeal, a lot of them came back. And not only did they come back with their bartending skills, and other bartenders who hadn't, who hadn't been American came back to, Amer came to America to bartend, but they brought back ingredients and ideas and things, you know, different ways of mixing stuff. So, you know, the whole, th the, the point I, I tried to make and skipped over perhaps was, was that prohibition ended up having this effect of sending people away and bringing them back, but it brought ideas there and ideas here. And that was, that's true for Cuba, it's true for, for England and France, and, and Spain did a lot with American bartenders. I don't know about the bat, though, sorry. Anybody else? Great. Well, thank you. Thanks very much.